Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm Braxton Hunter, and along with me today is Danny and Eric. Two friends of mine, people that I have really come to appreciate in different ways and in some of the same ways. And tonight, we're going to have the first um, atheist versus Christian debate since 2009 on Trinity Radio. Um, uh, Danny was like five at that time. Uh, no, that's not true. But uh, I debated uh, Will the Atheist, two, two debates in 2009 or 10. And we haven't had a debate between atheists and Christians. We've had theological debates and things like that. But I am so excited that you're here. And today we are going to be debating the nature of the soul. And I think it's going to be so exciting. I'm going to follow the format of other uh, debate-type YouTube channels and not spend a whole lot of time in preamble, except to, first of all, let Danny and Eric say hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can speak. We've established that now. And um, I want to say that uh, that Danny is a person who has become kind of popular popping up on YouTube channel uh, discussions about philosophy of religion and things like that. And I've always appreciated him and enjoyed his content. He was recently on with one of our Trinity professors, Tim Stratton, giving an analysis of his debate with James White. Um, and he's a graduate student in philosophy, uh, former Christian. And uh, anything else I should say about you, Danny? You can find his YouTube channel at Phil Talk, and hopefully by the time you're watching this, I'll have it linked in the description. No, that pretty much sums it up. Thanks for having me on, Braxton. So excited to have you, Danny. And Eric is a longtime friend. Uh, first time I ever met him, as I've told many times, I thought he was an atheist. He walked into one of my uh, breakout groups with Matt Dillahunty. Um, both all wearing black. So I knew that those were um, like Sith colors or whatever. So, um, but, uh, but Eric's become a dear friend and has helped me out um, in many, many ways. And I'm so glad that you're here, Eric. Eric has done many, many debates. He is a seminarian working on uh, his own degrees right now. And Eric, I am just so thrilled to have you back again on Trinity Radio. Oh, thank you. It's always an honor to be here with you. All right. Yeah. Glad you're here. And so at this point, what we're going to do is the format is going to be 15 minutes for each of these men for opening statements. And then we'll do 45 minutes of just open dialogue. And then after that, we'll do five minutes of peace closing statements and then your questions. If you want your questions uh, to be answered, I can't guarantee it. I will follow Pritchett rules, which means Super Chats get, uh, get first choice. But um, put question at the beginning of your question, either way, and uh, in all caps. And I'll try to catch those as we go, and then we'll get to those at the end. Uh, with that, I'm excited to let Danny go ahead and begin with his opening statement. Danny, I'm going to pass it over to you with your PowerPoint, and the floor is all yours. Awesome. Um, thanks again for having me on so the topic of debate is, are human beings souls? And there might be some ways that we could interpret this question, but essentially I just want to reject the whole notion of soul. So no matter how you interpret it, whether you interpret it in, ter in terms of humans having souls or being identical to souls, right? I I'm here to present some arguments um, against the, the whole notion of, of souls. So no, let's hope that my, yeah, so the answer is no, all right, not for me. Um, but my objection, so here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to tailor my objections to be compatible with Christianity, okay? And also, I'm going to tailor my objections to be compatible with dualism, okay? In a way where my naturalist friends can grant dualism and still pose objections to people that believe that we are souls or have souls, um, as well as not to alienate Christians. Um, from if, if for some reason one of my arguments persuades you, um, you don't have to leave Christianity. In fact, I think there are some Christians like Peter Van Wagen who does not believe in souls, right? Uh, so in terms of how you would interpret that uh, theologically or biblically, uh, that's on the, the Christian side. But I'm just saying that there are Christians that I'm aware of that don't hold to the notion of soul. Okay. So quick exercise. What I want you to imagine right now is you in space, like an outer space, like out in the moon where the moon and asteroids and all stuff. Okay. Now, what did you imagine, right? Did you imagine uh, your body, like you in your clothes right now? Did you imagine yourself in an astronaut suit? Did you imagine your brain for those uh, mind brain identity theorists out there? And for those that maybe believe in the spiritual, did you not imagine anything? Did you just imagine some kind of like essence or soul stuff, which we'll get into. 
the point is, is that I don't think anyone was irrational for thinking of themselves in terms of, of their body or in an astronaut suit. And the usage of I is actually quite elusive in our common language, right? So look at all these usages of the, of the I here, right? I'm happy. I'm being seen. I'm having a heart attack. I'm dead. I'm a new person. I was a fetus. I think I'm sort of persuaded that each sense of I is a very different sense of I. Um, for instance, if we think that the I or the self is the soul, right? Well, we're going to have problems with I'm being seen and I'm having a heart attack. Okay. Maybe we can make sense of I am dead. I don't know. But it's not like heart, uh, souls can have heart attacks or souls are seen. When I looked at Braxton and Eric earlier, I'm not, I, I didn't think I was looking at their soul, right? So I, I, I want to stray away from, oh, well, let, an, analyzing our common language in terms of how we use I and then it's extrapolating metaphysical postulates like souls, right? So this is just a point to the notion of I. So my first thing is just the intelligibility of soul. What does it even mean? I think there, I think that's something that hopefully Eric will elaborate, but here's um, all I know in terms of what Eric has presented in the past. Um, it can cause and explain things. It's immaterial and it might be tied to essence. There's something about like the soul of X, just what it, it, whatever it must have to be that thing, right? And notice that I italicize must because that's a modal notion that um, we might have to, if he wants to understand soul in terms of essence, we're gonna have to evaluate that sense of must. Uh, so that's so far what I have to start with. But when you look at Eric's statements, there are some inconsistent renditions that I've seen, and maybe I'm misinterpreting him, but hopefully it'll clarify. In one hand, he says, I am a soul. And then he defines soul as an immaterial substance that possesses consciousness. So there's a little bit of lack of clarity in terms of what it means to possess. Um, does a soul possess the mind? And, um, and then in the bottom there, it says the soul is the self. So he's equating the, the subject, the subjectivity to soul. Um, and so I, I think there's a lack of clarity here that I hope that we'll address later on. Um, yeah, and so let's just analyze this one claim, though. I am a soul. I, you know, if I were to think Danny is a soul, first of all, I don't, this cannot be a definition. Uh, it's sort of, it, it would be sort of trivial and uninteresting if it were just a definition that what a person is is their soul. And um, it kind of reminds me of the best argument for pantheism. Let me give it to you. Okay. Um, let's say I stipulate by definition that the universe is God. Well, do you believe in the universe? You might say yes. Well, voila, you're a theist. You believe in God, right? It's true by definition. If you stipulate the definition as the universe as being God, right, then everyone is a theist, right? So I hope that it's not a definition. Okay. But at the same time, if it's not a definition, right, if it's something, if it's true, not because of the meanings of the words, right, then what makes this statement true, right? And so that's something that I'm hoping that Eric will clarify, okay? Also, the law of identity, Eric talks about how um, in order to preserve an identity relation, if A is unable to B, all its properties must be shared. So if something's true of A, it will also be true of B, okay? However, look at these statements. I am happy, I'm being seen, I'm having a heart attack. I did say there was a lot of ambiguity and equivocation, but this is just further... Um, this is a way of further showing the ambiguity and the notion of I. If I replaced I with my soul, then suddenly some of these propositions just hold false, right? So if it's the case that this I, the sense of self, is identical to and indiscernible from soul, right, we're going to have a problem with uh, that, that Leibniz's law of law of und and indiscernibles because there are going to be certain things true of the I that are not true of the soul, right, given um, what I know about it. Okay. Um, my second objection, uh, it actually, weirdly enough, people that accept souls, it has hallmarks of physicalism. I know that sounds very strange. They want to distance themselves like uh, a dualist, substance dualist. They want to distance themselves from physicalism. Actually, in my opinion, um, sort of think like a physicalist. Let me explain why. Okay. So a lot of philosophers of mind want to find the true nature of mind, right? So for the physicalist, they want to understand mind in terms of brain, right? So they take a kind of per, a subject thing, a first person point of view thing, and try to understand it in terms of something outside of that, that mentality brain, right? Well, I think people that accept souls or substance theory of that, that, char that characterize self in terms of soul are doing the same thing, right? They're taking mind, right? Something first person point of view mentality and understanding it in terms of soul stuff, okay? So in a way, there's a kind of, 
it, uh, I don't think Eric would ever say this in his life, but I see it as a kind of reduction, right? It's just a reduction to some other non-mental immaterial thing, right? So I think it's a very similar type of uh, problem. Okay, so what? how I see a true like dualist is someone saying, no, mind is not understood in terms of brain, nor is it understood in terms of soul. Mind is its own category. When I have a belief or desire, that's not understood of a soul state or a brain state. Okay. So that's how I see like the kind of purest form of dualism. Okay. Um, also, I think physicalists might even be in a better position, right? When we say water is H2O, we can evaluate that, right? Whether it's true or not, because we know we have a concept of H2O as these certain properties of hydrogen, oxygen, atoms, protons, whatever, right? Um, and the same way that if the reason why I think Eric pre can present pretty good objections to mind identity theory um, is that he knows what a brain is, right? And he characterizes, look, if brain is this, self is this, there's the law of indiscernibles, there's no way to reconcile an identity relation there. But given the kind of unintelligibility of soul that I just don't know what it really is, it's kind of it's sort of meaningless to me. It's like saying water's glob glob. Well, is that true? Well, what's glob glob? What if I tell you, well, glob glob is a physical thing and it causes things and explain things and it bears the essence of water. Well, then what are we left with? I mean, are you going to, okay, now you're, now you think water's glob glob? No, you need more information, right? And I think this is what's happening when we say the self is the soul. It's just a little, it's too ambiguous to accept. Okay. Um, and here's another parallel in terms of how the, uh, the law of indiscernibles there on the left column, all the way to the right column, there's basically physicalism. I am happy. Something like there is a brain state that constitutes happiness. Um, well, I don't see why the people that accept souls have it any different, right? I'm happy. Is that, does that just mean there's some soul state that is, uh, that constitutes happiness or that makes happiness possible? Um, I think it suffers from the same problems that, uh, Eric wants to, uh, to pose against the physicalist. Okay. Um, so essentially, could, here's another demonstration why it's kind of like physicalist-like, okay? Brain, right? Well, let's just scratch out, like I did, soul and put brain. A material substance that possesses consciousness along with its states and properties and animates the body. That's physicalism, right? So it just it just has striking resemblance uh, with physicalism, albeit that Eric does not construe the soul as uh, material, okay? Another last objection before I wrap up. I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna change Occam's Razor to a God version of Occam's Razor. So God has a choice um, between two worlds, right? He gets to actualize one of these two worlds. He can actualize a world on my left. I hope I don't think I'm sorry to challenge with left and right, but uh, where without the soul, without the red letters, right? Um, he can he can actualize that world, or he can characterize the world on the on the right. Okay. Now, God has a set of aims. He wants to create Eric for a certain purpose. So he has to give him a mind. He has to give him free will, the capacity to be moral, a body, right? And once he can, you know, actualizes those sorts of things, he's in, it, then he accomplishes a certain aim, whether that be to be with Eric and um, forever in heaven or whatever. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I think God could do that without soul, right? God essentially could instantiate the left. Why would he need to instantiate this extra thing called soul to uh, satisfy his desires or his aims for Eric, right? It seems superfluous. It seems like you can just get rid of the term, at least in a metaphysical sense. I'm fine with understanding soul in a metaphorical sense or, you know, talking about your very sense of personality or something like that, or how you see yourself in terms of your Christian identity, your soul. But other, in terms of this like robust metaphysical postulate, it seems like God doesn't need it at all. So there's a kind of uh, version of Occam's razor there that I think uh, holds true, okay? As far as my view, I understand self in terms of the mental, right? So I, here I am, Danny. I have my memories, my beliefs, my emotions, my hopes and dreams. And I think that when you get rid of them all, right, you get rid of my beliefs, you get rid of my emotions, you get rid of my uh, memories, my hopes and dreams. I don't feel like I exist anymore, right? But Eric would say there's this thing left over called soul that is me, right? And I'm saying that, I mean, maybe we could extend the analogy. Imagine if... You, Eric replaced all of my beliefs with his beliefs and emotions and hopes and dreams and everything. Right. And, um, I just feel like you've eliminated me. Um, so I don't really think we should understand soul in terms of anything, but the mental at the very least. Okay. Um, I think that concludes my presentation. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks.
All right. Whoops. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm back. That was excellent. Thank you for that. And Eric, are you ready to jump on it? Sure. All right. I'm going to switch over to Eric now for his 15 minute opening. Uh, can you, there, you see my screen? My yep. slide is it yellow? It is. Yeah. Oh. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, first, just want to thank Danny for uh, for going first because um, I wasn't familiar with his position. He was gracious enough to to go first. So yeah, and and thanks for that, uh, Danny. I appreciate appreciate especially you explaining where where the disagreements lie. So two basic points um, that I usually use for. And let me start my timer. Um, that. Um, the existence of the soul, the first being that consciousness is not physical, which I won't spend too much time on because Danny and I disagree here. Uh, the second is that I am more than a brain and body. I am a soul. Um, also, as a disclaimer, I didn't have time to fix my slides. So where the slides don't necessarily apply to Danny's position, I'll, I'll do my best to clarify and modify it to Danny's position. So as, as he showed, uh, my definition of the soul, and this is one that uh, Moreland uses as well, is that the soul is an immaterial substance that possesses consciousness along with its states and properties and animates the body. So the soul is a self, the conscious subject. <clears throat> now, um, uh, given that uh, Danny had brought up, you know, why does God need the soul stuff? Well, hopefully this is a clarification. It's that uh, a mind, on my view, would presuppose a soul. Uh, um, a mind is a faculty of the soul. So you can think of the soul as different, uh, a, a, a list of different capacities or faculties, and my soul has a faculty of mind. Um, so if there is a mind, then on my view, you're presupposing a soul. Uh, the law of identity, as he brought up earlier, this is what I use to show, uh, to make my case for these two basic points. And I, I won't try and rebut what he said. We can get into that into the discussion, but I think he brought up some interesting points that I can definitely help to clarify. Um, According to the law of identity, if some A is identical to B, and in philosophy, identity means literally the same thing as, <clears throat> um, then whatever's true of one is true of the other. In other words, we're just using two different names or references to refer to the same thing. So if Eric Hernandez is true of the Christian presenter debater in this um, in this debate, then whatever's true of Eric Hernandez is going to be true of the Christian debater, um, because we're talking about one person, not two. So in principle, given liveness of the law of identity, if I can find something true of one that's not true of the other, then they're not the same thing. Now, when it comes to uh, the application, um, just to kind of throw this out there, again, I'm not arguing against Danny's position, but just clarifying my own here. If the mind and brain are the same thing, if there is no soul, then uh, you're going to have to reduce the mind to something identical or reducible to the brain. Now, in Danny's case, he holds that the mind is not physical, so this wouldn't necessarily, or at least not directly, not yet apply to his position, but for the sake of argument, um, there are things true of the mind that are true of the brain. Ignore the physicalism aspect. That's the part that does not apply to him because he's not a physicalist, not in this sense. But um, again, there are things true of my mind that are not true of my brain and vice versa. Some examples. You, uh, so let, let's even define what is consciousness. Consciousness comes in five states. And these states of consciousness can be seen as modes of the soul that the soul's in. Um, so again, to clarify, my mind is a faculty of my soul. And my soul, which is which possesses my mind, can be in different states or modes. So my uh, there are five states of consciousness. There are thoughts, beliefs, sensations, desires, and volition, or we can say acts of will. Uh, take a state of my uh, of my mind, like my thoughts or beliefs. My thoughts or beliefs can be true or false, but no region of my brain is true or false. And then the vice versa aspect, um, my brain can weigh three pounds, my thoughts don't weigh three pounds. Uh, the smell of a rose uh, is a mental state, it's a sensation, but my brain can be seven inches long, but the smell of a rose or the taste of a banana is not seven inches long. So while uh, there can be many more examples, if there are things true of my mind that are not true of my brain, they cannot be the same thing. And I would go further and argue that there are no, consciousness cannot be described in any kind of physical states while the brain can or anything physical um, is not going to apply to something mental. They're going to be different things because there's ontologically speaking something distinct between them. So um, cause or dependence is not the same thing as identity. If I'm going to skip this, if we need to go into it, we can, but basically some will argue that because messing with states of my brain can cause different states of my mind, I don't reject that, but that's just showing a cause or dependence relation. It's not showing an identity relation, which would be that um, that the mind is the brain or something like that. Again, uh, I don't think Danny's going to be arguing that, um, so I'm going to skip that for now. Um, 
Many philosophers have talked about that you cannot get mind from matter. Um, Colin again says that any naturalistic explanation borders on sure magic. Jaguan Kim, um, for those who, who may uh, appeal to some type of emergent view, he says that correlations are not explanations, but are in fact the very thing that need explaining. So just labeling something emergent or supervenient, all that does is slap a label on the problem. It does not uh, give an answer to the problem. Uh, for my uh, second point, I want to give a few arguments. <clears throat> and again, I'll have to modify them to uh, um, accommodate to Danny's view. Now, if I'm just a brain and body, uh, th then I would be what you call a mirrorological aggregate. Now, I don't think Danny, um, from our interactions, he hasn't given a position. Um, I was kind of hoping to hear that, but uh, what he defines as the I. Um, in private messaging back and forth, he says he leans to a bundle view, uh, which would be, which is sometimes called a bundle view of substance. Um, so a, a mirrorological aggregate is a collection of separable parts held together in a certain structure. Now, for Danny's view, this would still be some type of an aggregate position, but it's just a bundle of properties. It is an aggregate of properties um, uh, held together in a certain relation. So now we're just talking about uh, properties, and these would have to include immaterial properties. Um, so the first argument I would claim, and again, replace the first premise would have to be modified rather than I am a purely physical object for Danny's view. We could say, given the two options on the table, I'm either a bundle, an aggregate of properties held together in a certain type of relation or an immaterial soul. Um, now, to even clarify this, because um, I want to try and be as clear as possible, the reason that um, these are two points, the first being that consciousness is not physical, is because when we use the word I, um, let, me, let me even just go back to that. When we use the word I, it's an indexical word that refers to something. So when I use the word I, what am I referring to? So when Danny said, imagine yourself in space, what are you thinking of? That is the I. He's referring to the I. Now, I'll, I'll get to the illustration maybe when we get into our open conversation. But basically, I'll put it this way. <clears throat> when properties are exemplified in the world, they don't just show up or float around by themselves. For example, when redness is instantiated or shows up in, in the world, Say I'm driving down the highway, I don't try to avoid hitting the property of redness, but rather I try to avoid hitting something that possesses a property of redness, namely a red car. Um, in a similar way, if both Danny and I grant that there are uh, these immaterial mental states and properties, the next question would be what possesses them? So that's what I meant about the possession, the grounding of these things. Thoughts have thinkers. A thought does not just float around in the air by itself, so to speak much like the color red doesn't just float around. It's possessed and grounded in something. Without me, there would be no Eric's thoughts if there were no Eric. So when I use the word I, I'm talking about the conscious self, the thing possessing these mental states and properties. So the next question becomes, what am I? Um, again, the two options on the table is an immaterial substance, a soul, or a bundle of properties. Now, going back to this, um, if I'm either a bundle of properties held together in a certain relation or an immaterial soul. If I am just a bundle of properties and I do not retain identity through change. Um, if I'm just a bundle of certain properties and the, I currently possess the property of a certain height, but when I was three years old, I possessed the property of having a different height. Um, I would argue that on Danny's view, then you're not going to retain identity through change because now you have two different bundles of properties. So, if I do maintain identity to change, then I'm not just a bundle of properties in a certain relation. I am a soul. In other words, I'm going to argue that on Danny's view, you cannot retain identity to change. In fact, every time he has new mental states, your conscious states are constantly in flux. So you're going to constantly change out the properties that you possess mentally. Now, if I am identical or reducible to a bundle of properties, and if this is Danny's position, and he can clarify if it's not, then you're not going to retain identity to change, which means throughout this entire two hour or so debate, I will be talking to a number of Danny states or, or succession of Danny stages, if you will. And I won't be talking to the same Danny from one moment to the next. The indivisibility of personhood, same thing would apply. Um, bundle of uh, A bundle of properties can be divided in common percentages or degrees. So you can have more or less bundle of properties. But I cannot be divided or come in percentages or degrees. I'm an all or nothing kind of thing, meaning I can gain and lose and, and have more or less amount of properties, but that does not make me more or less of a person. I am a 
uh, a full person, though I may come to possess more or less properties. So if I am an all or nothing kind of thing, then I'm not a purely physical object. I am a soul. Uh, the argument from free will, um, again, I would go to I'm either a purely physical object, but again, excuse me, for Danny's view, a bundle of properties or an immaterial soul. If I am a bundle of properties, I do not possess free will. Now, I'm going to have to modify this a little more because <clears throat> um, depending on how Danny will clarify his view, he's at least it seems to be a property dualist, uh, namely that that uh, there are physical properties, but then there are these immaterial mental properties. Now, I'd be curious as to Danny would handle the question of free will um, because I'm going to say on his view, he's going to have to hold to some type of epiphenomenalism. What is that? It is basically that uh, you don't have this top-down causation. It's just bottom-up. Um, as a simplified illustration, a, a pile of wooden boards, if you rearrange their structure, it can, it can possess the property of being a raft. But this property of being a raft isn't what causes the boards or their structure. It's the structure of the boards that cause the property of it being a raft. So you don't have uh, – the causation is one way. Um, on epiphenomenalism, whatever it is that causes these mental states – again, I don't know what Danny's view is on that. But whatever causes these mental states to occur or exist are not going to in turn turn around and cause anything else uh, uh, on the physical bottom down. Um, so – there would be no way to have or possess free will. By free will, I would appeal to what I've understood is called the sourcehood view, that I'm the originator or source of my will or actions. I am the first mover. Um, so if I do possess free will, then I'm not just a bundle of properties held together in a certain relation. I am a soul. One last argument I want to throw out there that I think is directly relevant to Danny's view, um, <clears throat> excuse me, would be an argument that Eric LaRock offers. And um, uh, Hasker um, has also offered this, known as the unity of consciousness or the unity of uh, a unified visual field. Now, basically, what I'm going to argue is that in order – so right now, I, if I were to introspect, I can think about the mental states that I'm experiencing. I can feel the temperature in my room. My hands are a little bit colder. I can feel the bottom of my chair is soft. Um, the edges of my chair are a little bit rough. But I'm not – experiencing these um, states individually, I'm experiencing them as a unity. So there must be something that grounds and unifies all my mental experiences. And I would say that that's going to be the immaterial soul. Another way to put this, referring more specifically now to Eric LaRock's argument, <clears throat> um, there's been some interesting discoveries in neuroscience, essentially that when a person looks at an object, uh, there are various regions of the brain that are associated with certain aspects of that object. So one uh, a region of my brain or, or aspect of my brain is, is um, processing, if you will, I use that word loosely, the shape of the object, the size of the object, the placement of the object, whether or not it's in motion or rest. And each of these corresponding properties of an object are going to be terminated in, in different regions of the brain. But there is no, but, but again, when I look at these objects, I don't just see individual states. Like I don't just see the shape or the color. I see everything in a unified visual field. Think of a camera, uh, a, a picture, excuse me. Uh, the picture we could say is composed of an aggregate of pixels, but we don't see just one pixel individually at once. We see the entire panoramic unified visual field. So uh, Laurent gives the illustration of, um, he says, imagine there's, and I'm modifying it. Imagine there's 10 chefs in 10 separate kitchens. And each chef is working on an individual recipe of the cake. Even if all 10 chefs are working on the recipe of this cake at the same time, it does not follow that there is one chef working on the entire cake as a whole. For that, you would need some master chef to gather and unify all the respective uh, parts of the recipe into a whole unified cake. So unless there is a unifying master chef, you won't have a whole cake. In, in sticking with um, rather analogous to this, we could say that um, if I am a bundle of properties and there's nothing that's going to unite my uh, uh, visual field. So if I'm just a bundle of properties, I'm not going to have a unified visual field. I do have a unified visual field. Therefore, I'm not just a bundle of properties. I am a soul. In other words, just like the chef, you're going to need a master chef, the soul that is going to unite, possess and unite all of these into one unified consciousness or one unified visual field. And I'll argue that on Danny's view, that that can't be the case. Um, there has to be something that is grounding and unifying all these properties into one thing, as opposed to just 
a, a collection of things with certain relations? What is it that has possesses these relationships? What is it that gives unity to this? And what is it that makes me, me? Um, we, uh, there, there could be more to say, but my time's running out. So I, I'll just conclude with that. And I'm looking forward to the, uh, interaction. All right. Thank you both of you for those opening statements. And at this time, we're going to get to the fun part, the part that a lot of people will have skipped to, and that is the uh, back and forth. So um, theology and philosophy of religion geeks, here it comes. We're going to start for the next 45 minutes, um, a back and forth. I'm starting the timer now. I expect to learn from both of you. Thank you. And thank you all of you for being here. Again, I just want to say, I want to do more debates and things like this in the future. And we always have content related to worldview discussions. If that's something you're interested in, um, consider subscribing to the channel and turning on that notification bell. But uh, if this isn't your thing, then we'll see you later and God bless. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys to interact with each other. Whoever wants to start can start. All right. Thanks for your Thanks. Um, response, Eric. I, I do have a question. So if someone told us that mind presupposes brain, the first thing I would ask is well, why does that lot, why does it logically follow that mind presupposes brain? And so when you say mind presupposes soul, I'm actually asking the same question, right? And so part, I think what would help is if we really got into what you meant by soul and maybe why it might be entailed by mind or mentality. So I didn't know if you wanted to start there. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to start with kind of addressing some of the things you said, but but let, let's start okay. with that. So on my view, the mind is a capacity or a faculty of the soul. Um, so if there is a mind, it's going to presuppose an ontological grounding, which would be in an immaterial substance like the soul. Okay. Uh, so does, but to say that, there's a grounding relation is to distinguish them. For instance, many Christians say morality yep. is grounded in God. Morality and God are not the same thing. So there, right. if you want, okay. So if you want to preserve an identity relation between the self, which is um, me, like I take my beliefs, my pre things that are present to mind, me to be identical to soul, right? I don't, I think you're going to have to let go on that grounding relation. Yeah, no, I, I don't think so. And this, and I'm glad you brought that up because that segues into what I want wanted to respond to. So earlier you taught, you gave like different statements, like I am happy or my brain is happy, and then I forgot what the other thing was, or my soul is happy. So this goes into is uh, different types of ises. Um, there are four different types of ises, and I think you were uh, unintentionally, I'm sure, uh, confusing the different types of ises. There's an is of identity. There's an is of essential predication. An exists an is of accidental predication and an is of constitution. So if I were to say um, the person talking right now is identical to Eric Hernandez, that's an is of identity. They're the same thing. If I say Eric is human, I'm talking about an is of essential predication. Um, I predicate what it means to be human. If I say, um, if I were to say Eric is a mind that is an is of constitution part of what it means to be me is that i have this uh, uh these mental states and properties now the reason uh you wouldn't have to let go of that grounding objection is because i'm making a distinction between faculties of my soul so when i say the word i i am the thing that unifies and grounds these faculties to begin with so without a me there is no eric's mind without an eric so i eric in my soul and within my soul there are various faculties Okay. Um, so with respect to those statements, I understood that uh, the, the purpose of those statements that I had up on the, on the screen, well, I was, it was the fact that in our normal language, it's very ambiguous what people mean in terms of the I. Sometimes we use I to refer our, to our hands. Sometimes we refer, refer it to our, our, our mentality or aspects of our mentality. And so the point of those statements was to note the ambiguity in our, in our language and as to not extrapolate metaphysical conclusions from our everyday usage of the of, of I. Um, and so, yes, I understand can there was I a lot of, of course, of course. 
Uh, so, um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, well, well, first I'd say, you know, we, we shouldn't try and take philosophy. I, I, I'm agreeing with you in this aspect. We shouldn't, we shouldn't derive metaphysical uh, uh, truths from a loose popular sense of the way people use language. Now, but, I, but just because people can use language ambiguously doesn't mean that there is a, a proper definition, especially within a philosophical context, and especially when discussing uh, the philosophy of mind, how we use certain words. Uh, if someone were to say, you know, I'm compatible with my wife, I don't think anyone's going to mean think that this is that they're talking about a certain view of free will and determinism. I think we know what they mean. But when we're in a philosophical context, laying out and defining what we mean by certain terms, and I think it's perfectly uh, um, within our rights, if you will, uh, to, to use these terms in certain ways to I, define or identify what we say. So even if I were to say, oh, I, I how can I put it? Um, if Because one of the things you said is like, um, you mentioned that there's that that the physicalist has an advantage uh, in some aspects. Well, the only advantage would be that if you identify I with a body. So if I said I scrape my knee, then I'm not saying it's it's not an is of identity, but perhaps an is of constitution. That part of what constitutes me while I'm body is that I have a knee. So it's going to depend on what type of is you're using. But at the same time, if I'm speaking in a loose popular sense, I'm not doing philosophy of mind. So the only advantage the physicalist would have is that they can analyze my body, but if I am not identical to my body, which is what I argued, then they are not analyzing me. They are analyzing a part of me that, that is not that is a, an extension, if you will, of my soul, but they are not uh, analyzing me, Eric, the self. Just like when a scientist, neurologist looks at my brain, they are not looking at my thoughts. Right. Earlier you said that we have to be careful and, and try to analyze a proper definition, right, in, the, in a philosophical context. But that's kind of my point. There is no proper definition of the notion of I. Um, and uh, th that's from contending. Take the statement, and I don't think it's always a conflation of the notion of is. Like, take the statement or to the term male. I think my, male is a biological category. It is something that could be analyzed by the natural sciences. But when I say I am male, right, yeah, that's not that's perhaps not the is of identity, sure. But what I'm more interested in is that what is that usage of I, right? It can't be soul, right? Because soul is immaterial, and maleness only applies to material things, bodies, right? I don't think there's a male soul, certainly, right? <laughs> I um, do. Okay, so do you think God is male, for instance? No, I don't think God okay. has a gender. So, well, gen well, maybe you don't distinguish between gender and sex, perhaps not, and... That's fine. I don't want to get into that. But the point is, is that having X, Y chromosomes, having sec uh, sexual characteristics like uh, deep voice, uh, being tall, um, having certain genitalia, these are all physical characteristics that constitute male, right? We can look in a biology book and understand how institutionally they understand maleness, and then we can identify ourselves as that, right? I am um, male, right? And what I'm not doing is using that notion of I to refer to a soul, right? Because I don't, I don't really think it makes sense to say it would be a category error to understand that my soul has XY chromosomes or that it has certain genitalia or that it's hairy. Yeah. So, um, so I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I don't think it applies because, and this goes deeper into metaphysics. Um, so, I've heard Moreland say that the body is an external realization of an internal structure. So the reason I have the body that I do is because of the type of soul that I am. So when I say the word I, I'm saying I am identical to the essence. The the uh, the thing that I am is a soul. I'm not identical or reducible to a body. As a Christian, I believe I can exist disembodied in the intermediate state after death prior to the resurrection. Because if I'm going to say that having a body is essential to what the kind of thing I am, then while I'm in an intermediate disembodied state, I'm not me, but I don't think that would make sense. Now, granted, that's leaning on some theology, but I'm just pointing out the fact that um, it's not inconsistent and incoherent on my view that I am identical to a soul, though I am, though I can and am embodied, and that my body is an external realization of the type of structure that my soul has. So I have eyes because I have a soul that has the faculty to have sight, so it develops, if you will, eyeballs so that it can utilize its capacities. Okay, so in the case of a phrase like I am male, if, I, if you're saying I is identical to the self, or sorry, and self is identical to the soul, then you are you saying then 
that um, your soul is is male. Is that is that true? Is that how you would understand? Mm -hmm. And so by male, yeah. you're, you don't refer to um, like the sense of maleness that is understood in biology textbooks about XY chromosomes and all of that and having a certain genitalia that is not your conception of male. So, so I think to, if I can answer it this way, I, I think there needs to be a distinction at this point made between what something is ontologically and how we identify something epistemically. Um, so for example, uh, and you tell me if, if, and this is just a off shooting from the hip example. Um, I think part of what it means to be a person is to have the ultimate capacity for consciousness. Because earlier you said, if you took away your memories and your hopes and dreams, emotions and beliefs, then, you know, do you even exist? Well, I say, sure, if you're in a coma, you can still exist without these things, but you still have the ultimate capacity that when not in a coma, you can utilize these things. So I think reducing it to that gets into problems just like the one I just expressed. Um, so well, what I, I would say that? is- Can I respond to the coma? Can I respond to the coma sure, or sure. did you want to finish? Yeah, uh, I think that when you're asleep or you're in a coma, it's not that your beliefs are gone. There's just nothing present to mind, right? So there's it's it, it's totally sensical to say that if I were in a coma or if I were unconscious, someone knocked me out, right? that I still have these beliefs, inclinations, and dreams. They're just not present to mind. <clears throat> right. So so that kind of lends to what I'm saying. I still have the ultimate capacity for these things. Um, so ontologically, if that is within my essence, then even if you were to, hopefully this won't get this demonetized, if you were to castrate me, I'd still be a male because my body is just a reflection of the structure of my soul. So that's why I say there needs to be a distinction between the ontology and the epistemology, ontologically speaking, I would say that the nature of what I am can be uh, defined in terms of my ultimate capacities, even if my body does not express these ultimate capacities. So uh, because we brought it up, and I don't even know if I want to go here, but but we're going, mm -hmm. I'm going to at least touch on this. Um, that's yeah. why I don't, that's why I think even if you were to change your genitalia, you're not changing the kind of thing that you are, because you're just changing something that is, uh, constantly correlated with what it means to be male, but at essence, you would be a male or female without going into some other uh, possible rare uh, situations. I'm going to say that your body is an external realization of the internal structure of what you are. So if we see human beings that all have two hands and two legs, it wouldn't follow that someone without hands is, no, is not considered a human being because they still have the ultimate capacity for developing two hands, even, even if there was some type of physical hindrance. Hey, before you jump in on that, Danny, um, I, I'd like to ask a question that might help. And I know you've touched on this already, Eric, but um, I, I know that you um, I may be coming through on somebody's speaker, but I know that you um, uh, have a view of the soul uh, of the origin of the soul for any particular human, this traducianism idea. And I'm wondering if that I, I know you've kind of touched on this, but I don't know if the audience really recognizes that there is a clear difference in theology in Christian theology anyway about how the soul comes to be and that is either special creation where god just instantly creates one in someone like uh kind of like the special creation of adam and eve and all that except here it's the soul and not a physical thing um and then uh the traducian view what eric holds is more of a view that that i think an understanding of it might be helpful here because i think maybe i'm wrong eric but what we think of as you, even your physical body, like you said a moment ago, is in some sense a reflection of your soul. So if you want to get to what a person really is, then on this view, you would look to the soul um, and not the physical body. Um, is, is, that, is that where we're at? Uh, do you want to say anything related to that, Eric? Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think where uh well let, uh, danny do you have any, any questions on that or i don't know if 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 well uh, the whole point feeling? i didn't mean it is we could we could dedicate a conversation to the meaning of i am male and i didn't mean to go in that direction what i'm trying to show is that when we say stuff like i'm being seen by eric i don't think you are seeing my soul when i say that i am male and by male i mean i have xy chromosomes i'm not saying that my mind has xy chromosomes or that my soul has xy chromosomes if we're stipulating maleness in the institutional sense of the way the biologists construe male and female, perhaps you construe male and female differently, but that, 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 that I didn't mean to give a red herring. Um, the point is, is that when we say stuff like I, 
um, was being seen, I'm not committed to thinking that my soul was being seen. And that's to show that there's constant ambiguity and equivocation on the term I in our normal everyday language. And so we have to be careful just saying, well, there's an I out there. What's the sense of I that we're talking about when we're um, going about our day? I'm saying that sense of I constantly is in fluctuation. Yeah. So, um, I, I, so first I, I would say a, a lot of your opening argument would art would may suffice to argue against a Cartesian dualist. I'm not a Cartesian dualist. Um, I don't identify soul with just mine and I've kind of already touched on that. Um, mm -hmm. but okay. If, when I say, uh, if, if I were to say that you are seeing me, if I were to be technical philosophically, I, I would say you're seeing my body, uh, not technically me. Uh, but that's kind of like, like if you were to call me on the phone and I say, oh, um, Danny's calling me. Well, technically my phone's the one that's ringing that's doing the calling, right? It's not you because you calling me might be you standing next to me and shouting my name. But I could still say Danny's calling me, though it's a phone in, in a sense that is doing the calling. So I, I, I don't know if that, talking about the ambiguity of language would, would be not that you're trying to give a rebuttal, but I don't think that'd be directly relevant because there's all we have to do is clarify the ambiguity. Um, if, if I can ask a question, um, and I, I've asked you this in, in uh, over messaging, but um, I, I'm curious if you've given any more thought to it or have a position. And if you don't, that's fine. But on your view, what possesses consciousness? What is consciousness grounded in? Yeah, I don't even know what that means. I don't accept this sort of grounding relation. I, th I think that the grounding relation might even um, might even make you some in some cases in some versions of this view make you some kind of reductionist. Um, I don't think I think mind is irreducible, meaning that it doesn't nothing possesses it. It's not understood in terms of something else. It's when I have a belief, a mental state, it's understood alone, right? It's independent, right? And of course, there are things that cause it and bring it about. So in that sense, it's not independent, right? But um, I don't think it supervenes on anything. I don't think that it's grounded in anything. I don't think it's identical to anything. I think I just, when I have a belief, I simply have an attitude about what's true. So, but but I but I think it's directly relevant because because um, earlier you were saying it's kind of like a, a physicalist view. It, not necessarily. If if it's almost it's almost I don't know if slippery slope's the right one, but you know because this. Mm -hmm does this this is similar to doing that therefore you know they're they're the same thing and again that's not what you're saying but it, can I, it's, can it seems I, can, I clarify that argument? can i clarify that argument sure, sure. if a physicalist comes in and says oh and, and asks you or if you ask a physicalist what grounds a mental state right first of all they could be they could understand a mental state in terms of an, an irreducible and irreducible sense but they might just say well the brain grounds it right but it's irreducible okay so you can pull that move, but I just don't see why they're in, in, a, in a, any worse position than someone that says that my mental states or my mind is grounded by this soul state. So on one hand, you have some kind of physicalist that says my mental state is grounded by some brain state. And you're saying, well, my mental state or my mind is grounded by some soul state. And so I'm saying that it's the same kind of um, what if you're going to be critical of, of a physicalist doing that, then I think that uh, we should we should consider revising. Yeah, well, well, the reason I'm critical of that is not because of the move they made, but it's because I disagree with with their position. So, in other words, um, beca because I, there has to be a self that possesses the mind. Um, there Why has to be something true? ground. Well, because it, what if you say I have this belief, then what is the I? I mean, that, that's kind of the topic under consideration. Now, if I can respond to what you asked about. The reason I would I would uh, um, fault the physicalist for saying that my brain is what possesses or grounds my mental states is because if that is what they're going to identify as the I, if I am a brain, then they're going to have to bite the bullet of the implications of something like not having identity to change. Or but they're being not saying I'm the a brain. They're not saying that I'm a no, brain. They're I, I saying know. that. Okay. Well, well, okay. Well, maybe I misunderstood you. If whatever possesses consciousness is going to be you. So maybe I can ask it this way. When you say the word I, what are you referring to? So if I say I, I might just be talking about my consciousness. I don't think I am grounded in anything, right? I don't, I don't know what that means, honestly. Okay, this so, so let's, okay, okay. So when, when this would have to be an is of identity um, is what I'm, what I'm referring to. If you say I am my mental states, don't you constantly change mental states? Not always. There's some mental states that remain, um, some memories and, and beliefs that remain since childhood. And I use those to understand but, identity through time. 
But but are they not either adding or leaving or changing? I mean, you've changed your mind in the past, right? Even if you've... Right. So, my, for instance, well, my mental state... Go ahead, go ahead. You haven't gone from feeling hot to feeling cold? Sure, right? But that's not... that. I don't take... That's not what I call an identitarian commitment, right? I have to give you an example of something that grounds myself, right? Um, and maybe the best, the closest sense of grounding that might make sense that my belief that who my mother is, my father is, um, that belief has not changed since as long as I can remember that has persisted through time. My desire to teach and, um, lo my philosophy, my love philosophy, which really adds to my personhood has not changed in a long time. And I use those to understand this person that I am Danny. And I think other people use that too, right? Who is Danny or oh, the person that does YouTube videos that teaches that, that does this and that is that. Um, and I think that those mental states persist uh, through time, even though they're not present to mind. But okay, well, the, here, here's a problem because it sounds like what you're appealing to is going to be uh, an identity of memory or continuity of some psychological traits. But if God forbid you were to mm -hmm. get in an accident and forget everything, would you be a different person? Yes, absolutely. I wouldn't know who that was. So you would cease to exist and another lookalike Danny would come into existence. Yeah, look, if I if I was a mad scientist and kidnapped you, Eric, and I erased all your beliefs, desires, hopes, and dreams, every bit of them, and I replaced it with mine, I've destroyed you. No, so so yeah, so then I guess this is where the disagreement would 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 come about. And this is where I would say that the price tag or biting the bullet that you would have to take because Danny at this age, at your age right now, did not have the same beliefs and memories as Danny as even yesterday or five years old. No, I do. So, I do have some beliefs that are remain. My belief what, that who my mother is. But but time out. Let, let me maybe I should clarify. Okay. Let's say Danny at five years old has ten beliefs, and Danny at six years old has added another set of beliefs to his ten. Now there's eleven. These are not the same bundle and set of beliefs. There may be overlapping similar ones, but you and I may share some similar beliefs. It doesn't mean we're the same person. So if you're going to identify the I with a certain set of beliefs, then when you add or change or take away, now you have a new person, which means you're going to constantly be changing and ceasing. There's going to be a constant Danny lookalike ceasing to exist and coming into existence. And I think that's a price tag for that, for your position. In terms of what maintains identity through time, it's not the whole set, it's the subset, right? So my, my, some of my original beliefs, as long as I can remember who my mother was and my love for her and my love for my family, that's persist, that subset has, has persisted through time. And that is what sort of, as you would say, grounds my identity, right? And I think I'm not biting the bullet. I think you're biting the bullet when you say that if I took your beliefs and all your desires and your hopes and your dreams and your memories of your family and your friends, okay, your immediate family and friends, and replace it with my beliefs, you would be committed to thinking that that's you, yeah, um, I yeah, just want to I just want to jump in here for just a minute and ask because it, it sounds to me listening that Danny is it the case I should ask it as a question is it the case that you kind of do grant what Eric is after here with this point which is that yeah I mean it's entirely not only plausible but it seems like you might say it is the case that we are dynamic in precisely this way we change all the time not only our physical uh, makeup but also whatever you want to call the mental beliefs and things like that, we're constantly in flux, but it sounds like you're saying, I still, I still think I can call myself the same identity or the same person because mm -hmm. I, there are some desires and beliefs I have that have been there from, and that's what I anchor. Right. With. But doesn't it sound kind of like you are granting what Eric, I think is trying to get after. No. I, and let me, let me just, let me try to argue why I don't think so. Take this Dr. Pepper, right? This Dr. Pepper has a set of all these set of properties, right? Now, uh, a substance theorist is going to say that there's something that bears the properties. There's something that possesses the properties of the Dr. Pepper, right? And what Eric is saying that if I strip away all these properties, the redness, the size, the shape, the lettering, everything, that there's something left over, okay? But I'm saying that if you strip away all the properties, that's just indistinguishable from nothing, Right. In the same way that if I take my mind, he wants to say that there's something about the self that bears the mental events, the mentality, right? The memories, beliefs, desires, whatever. Right. And if you strip away all the mentality, you have something left over and that's you. But I'm saying that I don't, if I understand all myself in terms of who I love and what my deepest interests and hopes and dreams and memories, right? If someone took those away, that apparently that's, I'm still there. 
and then replaced it with Eric's beliefs, right? And Eric's deeply held uh, darkest secrets, commitments, whatever memories. It just seems like you've destroyed Danny and you put Eric in, right? And so what I'm trying to say is that I don't think we're over and above this subset of beliefs and desires that have remained through time with respect to what we are, how we see ourselves and, uh, and who we value um, kind of fundamentally. And I, I don't think that we need a, a further analysis of personhood past that. So, so I go ahead, uh, Eric, and feel like you can respond to that. Um, I know there was a lot brought up in the opening statements and maybe you guys want to move on to some of those things, but I'm perfectly happy with you all guiding this conversation however you want to. Uh, but I will tell everyone else that in just a little bit, we are going to take questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and stick them out there. I am adding them to a question box and holding on to them, whether they are super chat questions or not, but we will give privilege to those. I appreciate people sacrificing that way. And so with that, continue on guys. Um, I'm enjoying the discussion. Well, yeah. So, I but I think you are are granting what, what I'm saying is that you you don't retain identity through change and part replacement because uh, I want to clarify a few things. In order for there to be change, it's going to have to presuppose some type of sameness, something that is going to exist at the beginning, middle, during, and at the end of the change. So, when I go from three feet tall to five feet tall, I'm a little bit taller than five feet. Um, I it's not a new person coming to existence. It's the same person changing accidental properties. And I'll just reiterate and you can push back where you want. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, basically, because I, I, if, if you have a certain set of beliefs and you say at time T1, Danny is this set of beliefs. Well, then at T2, if you have a different or if you've changed your mind at any time in your life, or you've removed a belief or replaced it with another one, you are now a different set of psychological traits. And if that's the case, you're not, you are literally not changing. A Danny with these set of beliefs is ceasing to exist, and another lookalike Danny is coming into existence. And I think the problem with that is that, I mean, just, just 10 minutes ago, I was a little bit colder than what I am now. Now I'm a little bit warmer. Well, I've changed sensations and mental states. Our mental states are constantly changing. But if I am not identical to a set of mental states, well, then I can remain uh, uh, the same in a strict sense of identity to change. If on your view, you are identical to or reducible to a set of properties and mental states and you're constantly ceasing to exist and we're well, not even you something is constantly ceasing to exist and a new person is coming to existence and i've been talking to a number of different danny lookalikes throughout this whole debate mm -hmm. yeah so i think you've misunderstood my view my view is not that what danny is is the sub is the set of all my mental states as it uh, uh, I, that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is it's a subset of that set okay so for instance i have beliefs about you I have beliefs about this conversation. I have experiences right now. That I'm, I'm, none of that is part of this subset of beliefs, which I call identitarian commitments. There are beliefs and desires and memories that I have that if I did cease to have, I wouldn't be able to recognize myself, right? And so you're right. I agree that going from, I was cold in this other room and I, I'm now I'm a little bit warm in this room. That's a change in mental state, but it's not changing my personhood because it's not a change. It, my, my sensations and my beliefs and my experiences with respect to being going from hot to cold is not part of that subset of identity and commitments. Most identity and commitments are going to be beliefs like who your mother and father was, who you love fundamentally. And I think, yes, there is a sense in which we can say that my personhood has changed or there's been that, or we add properties, right? I think I was a very different person in a sense, right? Um, and when we use that language, I mean, I think Christians should really understand this too, right? This concept of being reborn in Christ, right? Now, I understand that they're not using, like when, they, when a Christian says, I'm now a different person, right? They're not saying that I'm a different soul. I understand that. But what they're saying is that I have now very different commitments about how I see myself and with respect to God. I am a follower of Christ. That becomes an identitarian commitment. And some Christians in the chat if they lost that belief, if they've lost the desire to follow Christ, they would look at themselves, they would cease to recognize themselves, right? And so when I'm using personhood, right, or, or Danny or Eric, I'm really talking about that special subset of beliefs that you might have. And, um, and, and we can get more specific. There could be with subsets within subsets. I think that when I'm saying that I'm the same person I was uh, uh, today, as I was when I was six years old, I didn't have any beliefs about, you know, strong beliefs about 
who I loved right now and my wife and stuff like that. I'm talking about even a smaller subset that maintains identity through time, namely the beliefs about my parents or who I loved at that time. And I still love them today. So, so basically what we're both trying to do, and I think any of you is going to have to do is, is we're appealing to essentialism, that there is a certain set of essential properties about something that makes a thing what it is. That is essentialism. Um, now where I'm going to push back is I think that on your view, you're going to have to have an arb arbitrary set of essential beliefs or, or mental states. Because for example, when you were one years old, you probably did not know who your parents were because you just did not have the cognitive ability to even have the concept of a mother or a father, much less know who my mother and father was. So if that's one of your, and, and I'm going to say it respectfully, it's, it's an arbitrary uh, a set of essentialism, um, then at the moment you begin to know who your mother and father were, then you uh, uh, one person has ceased to exist, namely someone who didn't know who the mother and father was, and a new person has come into existence. And let's, I hear a neck, I don't, I don't know where that's coming from. Um, oh, is that coming and from? Then, and then, um, and then let let's suppose again, God forbid, you find out that um, you were adopted. You know, your parents come out and say, "Hey, you were adopted," and then you find out who your biological parents actually were. Well, then now that that second lookalike Danny has ceased to exist, and a new Danny has come into existence. And then, um, the, with, with regards to even the save thing, um, now I am the same person. Uh, because we're talking about a strict sense of identity, not a popular loose sense of identity. If if I am not the same person who was once a sinner and got saved by grace through faith, not by my own work so anyone can boast, um, then, then God did not save me. That person ceased to exist, and he created another person that was saved. But now I do believe I'm the same person. Uh, um, so when we're talking about, in other words, that that passage or that, that theological doctrine is not talking about a, a strict act not talking about identity in the sense that we're talking about here philosophically. And I'll say one last example, and we can move on if you'd like, or you can respond is that if, if you were married and you got in a car wreck, I don't think you could honestly come to that person and say, Hey, I'm single now because I have no idea who you are. I think you'd still be married to that person. You just lost some accidental properties that were part of you, such as your mental states. Hey, Danny, you feel free to respond to that. Um, but before you do, um, I just wanted to jump in and say, and ask you this question, and maybe you can put this at the back of the deck, okay? Because I don't want to knock you off whatever you're about to say. But um, um, would would you not like if it were the case, like let's say you did have to bite this bullet, right? And I understand you don't think you do, and we want to make that clear. But if you did have to bite this bullet and say, yeah, I'm multiple different people throughout my life. That's just the way it is. I'm dynamic in in that way, such that I can honestly say I'm not the same person that was ten years ago or five years ago or whatever or at the beginning of this conversation, what does that do to your case in your opinion? Would that be a, would that be a deal breaker or would that just be an uncomfortable reality? What's, what's at stake with this, I guess, is the question. Yeah, that's a good question. I, so a lot of this is conventional, right? So when I say that I'm, I'm the same person or same thing I was, you know, and, if, and uh, that was me forming in the womb. I'm, 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 I have a different criteria of sameness. I'm actually might be just talking about that's the same body. Right. In that it has the same DNA or whatever, but I'm not talking about mentality. I don't think I, I mean, it's very plausible that I had no mentality uh, or the body that I, I embody now had no mentality um, it, when it, when it, in the embryonic stage. Um, but then when I say that I am the same person I was, was five years old, I might be specifying um, a, a specific set of states with respect to my parents and my, and, and um, but then when I say that I, I was, I changed after becoming a Christian it widens. So I think there's something true about what you're saying, Braxton, in the sense that when we are talking about sameness or identity through time, it's conventional with respect to what standards we set for sameness, right? I don't really think about, I don't really think of this in terms of like the real me, like this, this soul that Eric wants to post that that's been persistent through time, right? I, I think that really I might be talking and ambiguously and, and, and I would have to stipulate what I mean when I say I'm the same Zygo, that's the zygote was me, or that was uh, that was not me prior to being a Christian, right? That was a different person, right? And I think that you just you would we would we would just ask the person, okay, what do you mean when you say you were a different person or you were the same person? And then you stipulate the standards by which you um, ground continuity through time. I don't think I, I think that, um, and I and the last thing I'm going to say as far as biting the bullet, I really think that 
it, I would be a different person if someone erased all of my beliefs and desires and replaced it with someone else's, right? I just don't think that would be me in any sense. And if that's a bullet to bite, then I bite that bullet happily. It's a yummy bullet. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you have the last word on that. We, okay. we can, because I'll just be repeating, you know, what I've said before. So I don't know if you want to, you want to jump in and ask some things or. Um, okay. Um, so going, I, because I don't want to ask a question that will lead us back there, right? And I, on accident, but I feel like a lot. But um, so this this idea that we, we were talking about um, mind presupposes soul. Do you think that's a logical relation in the same way that uh, a bachelor presupposes a man? Um, not in in necessarily in that a priori sense, and that might be due to a limitation of language and how we understand things. But I think if my view is correct, then a mind would presuppose a soul. Because I'll 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 do you one better, if you will. I think a body presupposes a soul. But these are not things that we may be able to find in an a priori sense, but may be things that we we discover in an a posteriori sense. Because I'll say this: I am more certain that I have a soul than I am that I have a body. Okay. So going, I guess the idea is that could God accomplish his aims without this soul? It seems like it's logically possible because if you don't think it's a logical relation, then it seems like God can make Eric exactly as you are right now, right? Without the, without a soul. Seems like it, in, in the way that the language is used in biblically might be more metaphorical. Let's just grant that for sake of argument. But the, the point is that, um, he, with respect to who you are, he's just going to understand that in terms of where your heart is, where your emotions are, wh who you're committed to, um, what you want to do in life, um, those sorts of things, right? I feel like he could accomplish his aims without positing a soul. So uh, now, of course, you, you disagree with my view. I'm hearing the echo again. I'm sorry. Uh, let me ADHD mute. throws me off when I hear that echo. Um, yeah, just tell me to mute. <laughs> Let me get back on, on track here. Uh, um, so, so remember, on my view, I am a soul. I am identical to my soul. Like, that is me. Eric Hernandez, the person talking. Same. Is that a logical references. truth? Is that a logical truth? I think so. I, I think based on my view, sure. And it, depending on what you mean by logical, you mean can I can I deduce that by just thinking? Well, maybe not if I'm five years old. But I think uh, uh, when we introspect, like I'll, I'll go back to saying I'm more certain than I have a soul, that I am a soul than I have a body. But le let me finish unpacking the, the, the previous thought is that <clears> – <throat> so when I say I or me, again, I am identical to my soul. So if you say can God create Eric without a soul – you're essentially saying, on my view, can God create Eric without Eric? Well, no, because I am my soul. Um, that that, is, that I, I am an immaterial substance. So uh, also, I'd go further to say that, that thoughts have thinkers, so the thought is grounded in a thinker, namely me, the soul. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, go, go ahead and, and comment or push back on that. Yeah, like. so if it's a logical truth, it's some kind of tautology or definition, right? And this is mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. one of the arguments... One of the arguments that I gave right, against this view about it being an analytic or a tautology truth, whatever, um, is that the pantheist argument, right? What that you might ask, well, is the universe God? And say, well, it's, I just stipulate it's by definition that the God is the universe. And then suddenly everyone's a theist. So in a way that I, I don't, I'm not going to disagree with you, right? And there's this trivial sense in which if I believe in Eric, and what you mean by the term I or Eric is by soul, then I believe in souls, right? But I, I mean, my original concept of Eric doesn't change. I'm not adding anything to my 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 concept of you. Well, well I think you would have to if you're going to grant my view because, um, okay, if you don't think I am a soul, then, then you would still think I am Eric, but you would just disagree with my ontological position of what I am. So, um, but, but if, if you were for the sake of argument to grant my position, then yes, you have added something to you, namely that I'm an immaterial substance. I'm not going to grant the, the death of my body. No, I said for the sake of argument, if you did. I'm, but I'm not. What's, what's going on here is that what you're saying is that if it's a definition, you're telling me this is what I mean by the term, but you can't be wrong about what you mean by a term. If I tell you, Eric, what I mean by universe is God, right? Then I can't be wrong about that. Okay, so you're right, gonna, but, so I can but but I can disagree and and say uh, that I don't think the universe is God, 
And, and of course, you would disagree and say, well, I don't think you are. So that may, maybe I should have, if I word it poorly, forgive me. But you said, if you grant that, and I took that to mean you granted my position for the sake of argument, you said then that wouldn't add anything to my conception of you. I think if you grant my position, even if for the sake of argument, that would add of your conception of what I am and the kind of thing I am. Okay. So th th then that means that there's something, then it's just not true by definition, right? Because look, there's a certain conception that I have of Eric, right? I, I've seen your Facebook photos because I stalked you and I've seen your family, beautiful family. And I see that your passion for Christianity and apologetics, this is my concept of you. And I feel like it's really to heart of, of how you see yourself. Right. And then you're telling me, well, I'm a soul. And you want me to include this extra thing called soul into your identity, okay? And I'm sort of, well, if you, on one hand, you might say, well, what I mean by all of that, that concept of Eric is soul. What I mean by the term Eric is just soul. Then really there's, a, it, it, there's not, that's just a terminological dispute. But if it's not by definition, then you want me to add a substantive, uh, I guess, property to the entity that is Eric. And so that comes down to the question, what exactly is a soul such that it's distinguished from Eric, such that you're adding to my concept? Well, well, I think what you, so the things you mentioned about, you know, family and everything, and, and I appreciate that, these would be accidental properties, not essential properties of me. Just like, for example, let me let me turn, turn the tables if I can. So you said, and if you didn't say that, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understood you correctly, that you're an identical to maybe a subset of beliefs? Yeah, a, sub, a subset of beliefs, okay. but it just depends on the, the in certain cases, I might mean something different when I say I'm the same person in this case or in that case. It just stipulates. So am I the same person I was yesterday? Well, what's my criteria for saying this? That I'm, um, you know, I might stipulate that I have love for my wife and all this stuff, right? Almost and, and in that sense, I have the same beliefs yesterday. So I am the same person I, I endured their time, right? So it just depends on <laughs> what we're talking about. So, so well, right. But so my point to that was, if you are identical to a certain subset of beliefs, then I can say, Danny has a full head of hair. Danny is wearing a maroon sweater, but I would not be pointing to the essential aspects of you, but accidental properties of you. So all, mm -hmm. so that's, so in other words, it would, it, it would apply both ways. So I don't see how that's a problem in that your conception of me would be based on a conception of accidental properties, but not essential properties. I'm getting mm -hmm. to the ontological foundation of what I am and what I'm identical to, because I am not identical to my family or my set of beliefs or the, the kind of Christian I am. Because at one point, let's say uh, before I was saved, you know, then, then I wasn't me, which I guess would be consistent on your view because then it's a different person. But on my view, these are just accidental properties that can come and go and change. So your conception of me would be a conception of the accidental properties that I currently possess. Okay. So the, when I gave you my certain mental dispositions or beliefs that I, like I, I told you, I, I love for my wife, I do this, I do that. I take this to be identity and commitments. And if you came across someone that did not have those views under that sort of stipulation, that's just not me, right? That's someone else. And so I, what I, and notice that when I said that I know Eric, right? And this is the whole point of dating, right? You're trying to discover each other's identitarian commitments, what you stand for, right? And I think that, um, so if like for you, right, it seems like being a Christian is very close to your identity, very close to your person, right? Um, it's not as close, uh, it's, it, your beliefs about what you're wearing right now are not as close to your personhood, right? It seems like you would lose a big part of your identity if you cease to be a, uh, become a Christian, right? And if you change shirts, that doesn't really matter with respect to how you see yourself, right? And so I, when I say, go ahead. You, yeah, you, you want to finish? Uh, well, no, no, no. I, I think I, if you found something to respond to, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think you're confusing identity with personality. Because I think you're going back to biting the bullet. And, and if you're okay with it, fine. I'm, I don't mean that in a, 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 a pejorative sense. But in other words, if if you then the beliefs you hold right now and, and and you know you fall in love with someone well they may not have fallen in love with you five years ago if let's say you used to be like an ex-convict gangster who would like you know ride around in a in a low rider you know in a hoodie and whatnot but it, it was still you with just different sets of beliefs and attributes so um accidental properties so um yeah i I, I would just go back to the the. I think you're confusing identity with personality. Well, let me uh, let me tell you what I mean by personality. Maybe this is not. I, I okay. take personality to be something different than personhood. Personality has to do with your dispositions to act or something like that. So 
being honest, right? Then you have a disposition to not lie. If you ask me, what do I have for breakfast? And I have, I might have, my personality might be such that I'm, I'm I like, I want to lie about that. I don't know. Right. Um, but with respect to personhood, I'm not really talking about making predictions about what I would do or not do in the situations where I'd be moral or immoral in certain situations. I think that relates to personality. I'm talking about how I see myself fundamentally. I see myself uh, when I was a Christian, I saw myself as a Christian, right? I think now I would definitely would say my personhood has changed, right? I'm no longer a Christian. Being a Christian was very important to me th uh, 50 years, uh, 50 years ago, uh, 10, uh, five years ago. Um, now, when I say that I am the same person, though, as I was five years ago, I'm just using different criteria. What I'm trying to say with respect to identity through time is that it's mostly conventional, right? I don't really understand this kind of real sense of persistence through time. It's conventional to me. Yeah, and, and I'm talking about a strict, absolute sense of identity, which, which in the literature means that there's something underlying this, underlining these accidental changes. But like uh, even something you referred to earlier, you said you wouldn't recognize yourself if you had a different set of this or that. But wouldn't recognizing yourself presuppose that there is a self to begin with? And how would you know which set of criteria to look for to, quote, recognize yourself? Because now it seems like you're going to a third person analyzable perspective, which which I've heard you say is not reducible to some first person. So if you were to try and rec in other words, you have to know that you are a self before you can try and recognize yourself. That's soft temporally. So look, if you told me, uh, Danny, I got some news for you. Uh, in the future, you are going to be a serial killer and um, you're, you would have killed your family and you're no longer teaching. You hate philosophy. Um, you did all this horrible stuff. I would, I would, I would be like, that's just not, there's no way, right? That's just, I wouldn't recognize myself that. So in, the way that I would understand this is that in terms of how I see myself now versus, you know, how my past or future self would see the different um, indexes of time. Yeah. And, and I think that's where the distinction of the epistemic conditions and ontological conditions. And I think you're going to the epistemic, which I was talking about the ontological. Okay. Braxton? Go ahead. Go ahead, Danny. You can respond to that. Well, I, I think it's the idea is ontological, right? In, in nature, that if I if you told me that this is how you are, that's beingness, right? This is your mentality, the way you see yourself in the future, I would just distance myself from that. I'm like, that's not me. Right. That you must be mistaken. No way. I'm within my rights to do that. Okay. Uh, Eric, I'm sure you'll get a chance to respond to that during the, the question and answer time. So let's go ahead and move into that. Now we have had a number of really great questions and I want to say, um, first of all, that, uh, I think it's pretty cool that we have, uh, both of you have fans in the audience. We have here, go Danny from just questions. And we have here from somebody named Jonathan Pritchett. Uh, saying Eric is my favorite apologist. He better not lose big time here. Uh, so Thanks, there, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get on to some serious stuff though. Here. Uh, let's wait. See. This wasn't serious stuff this whole time. What? That that was that was very serious. Right. Um. All right. Uh, Jackie says. I don't have a question. I just love Trinity Radio, and I'm delighted to be here from the U be, be here. Love from the UK, Braxton. I love your series on Jude. Thank you so much. If you don't know, I have a series on the Book of Genesis that's verse by verse. It's about 35 hours long. If you want to torture yourself with that, um, so thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that super chat. Um, here's one from Praise I Am for Danny, and the question is: Is Danny aware physicalism was debunked by Anton Zellinger in 2006 to 2007? Were you aware? of that Danny I was not a, aware of, of this person I don't even there you go I, so but uh, I'm not a, I don't see myself as a physicalist so mm. all right uh thank you praise I appreciate that and uh let's see here is another one for Danny this is from Dwayne Burke says, Danny, please research the gateway process. It was a study done by the CIA and Stanford Research Department that proved consciousness transcends time. It looks like everything you've said tonight has just been already destroyed by research. So um, <laughs> do you have any comment on this? Um, I'll look into it. Okay. Thank you for the super chat, Dwayne. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, can we get a definition from Danny or Eric on what an essence is? Is it supposed to be a Platonist thing? And then it goes on 
Uh, oh no, there's another question. So go, go. There we go with that. What do y'all mean by essence? You Danny, why don't first, you go you're, first? You're the essentialist. I, I'm not an essentialist, but the way I understood it in my in my PowerPoint was in terms of what and uh, the properties that something must have to be what it is. And I understand that notion of must. Um, is going to be a little bit different than a logical sense. Most essentialists are not appealing to logical necessity. They're appealing to something like metaphysical necessity. But maybe Eric has a different notion. Well, I, I think something that is going to be metaphysically necessary is also going to be logically necessary. Depends, I guess, what you mean by that. But, you know, there are hierarchies of necess necessity, as I'm sure you know, factual necessity, logical necessity, met metaphysical necessity. Um, so by by essentialism, we're talking, okay, the, it is an essential attribute of the number two to be even, which means the number two cannot cease to be even and continue to remain the number two. So there are certain essential properties or attributes of a thing that it must possess without which it cannot be the thing it is, it will cease to exist. So the reason I would say that we're both aiming at essentialism is because it seemed as if Danny was trying to nail down a set of criteria that makes him who he is, that if these things change, he would cease to exist. Hence, he would, he, it sounded like he was saying, these are the, going to be the essential attributes or thoughts or continuity of mental states that are essential to what I am. And if they change, I cease to exist. I can tell you've got, let, let's quote the other guy. You've got one in the chamber, don't you? Uh, but let's go ahead and go on to this and uh, maybe we can get some responses in it. This one is question. If I think this is a theological question for Eric. If we are souls and have a body and when we only see a reflection, when we physically see a body, then is physical creation not so important, presumably on Christianity? Like if all this emphasis is put on the soul and the body seems to be on your view, kind of a reflection of the soul, then is the body important, I guess? Oh, it's very important um, because so so none of what I said was a value judgment on either the, the soul or body. It was just making a, a metaphysical distinction of what I am identical to and what are extensions of me or parts in, or inseparable parts of me. Um, so the on my view, especially like you were alluding to earlier in the traducing view of the soul, there is a deep, deep integration with uh, my soul and my body and the natural state of my soul is to be embodied. So I'm not trying to posit some type of Gnostic view. I'm simply talking about identity and what, uh, uh, what I can't, what, what can change about me. And I cease to remain the same thing. What are the essential attributes of me? What I am at my core. Um, and I'm identical. What I, I am identical to the thin particular, not the thick particular that that's other more terms I, I won't get into, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of value to the body. That's why when in the final resurrection, we're going to have a body. All right. You have anything on that, Danny? You want to push back on that? No, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Thank, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Let's go on with to you then, Danny. Here's a question. I know we've kind of covered this terrain a little bit, but um, has he, I think he's talking about you now been different people. And is he back to the same person that he was prior to losing a, B, and C, or is he a new person? He means, I actually did these out of order. He gave two here. If Danny has three significant beliefs, A, B, and C, he loses A, but keeps B and C, gets A back, but then loses B, et cetera. If he eventually regains A, B, and C, uh, has he now been different people? And is he back to the same person? So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, the way that they set it up, I would be different persons. Um, so if you stipulate that, what I mean by person here is that having beliefs A, B, and C, and if it, if one of those uh, leave the subs the, the subset, then the person has changed, right? So I, what I'm trying to say is that it's conventional. So you have to first stipulate that this is the subset that I'm talking about. With respect to the person that had the subset of beliefs about my parents, right? That person has endured but until today. But with respect to the person that had beliefs A, B, and C, and then, then D, let's say, uh, is being a Christian, then that person ceased to exist uh, five years ago, right? And I'm fine with that. I think it's just when someone says that I've endured, I haven't endured to them or I was the same person, I think it's just best to ask what they mean, right? And in the case of Eric, he's appealing to soul, right? And if there is the substantive account of soul, then then yeah, I think then there's that that maintains, right? It's just Eric? conventional I see it. Yeah, I mean, I just think this goes back to biting the bullet. You know, like he even said, if you were to tell me in five years I'm going to be this and this, you know, he's going to say, well, no, that's not me because uh, it doesn't recognize it. But the same could be said of, you know, someone you marry and, you know, gets into a car accident and, you know, he wakes up after the coma and he sees his wife and he says, wait, I don't remember you. So I'm not married to you. I'm single. 
chunk deuce, you know, kind of thing. But I, I think it, it does go back to, you know, how we, uh, the argument that I use about the unified visual field, um, something has to possess that unified visual field. And, and it's going to have to be something that's going to unite and, and, and um, ground all of these things, even if they change and come and go. And I think if you're going to, uh, uh, I, I don't want to bring up another argument, but yeah, I, I, he's, he's at least being consistent. I just disagree with, with the consistency. And I think it's, it's metaphysically extravagant to become a new per no, to cease to exist. And a new person comes into existence just because certain beliefs change. Braxton, if you don't mind, I wanted to say, maybe tell you how I feel about this, right? It, it's like, you're, you're saying that if it's the same soul that did all those horrible things, right? Uh, be serial killer, all that stuff that I had stipulated earlier, that would still be me as the same soul. The way I feel like it is someone said, I, I took your brain, right? And, um, I, now that future brain has all did all that stuff, right? What I would do, the me today would say that brain has nothing to do with me, right? That's, that's exterior to my mentality. I, and that's how I feel with respect to the way that soul is being used here. I'm saying I would dissociate from that soul, right? And in the way that I, I, I would dissociate from that brain. And that's how I feel. I know that might not be a complete argument, but th in terms of the intuition, it, that's where <coughs> my intuitive fa uh, faculties are it, right now. It does strike me at this point, as I've been listening, that um, one clear, I guess, thing would be if your intuition tells you that that's unacceptable, that I've been more than one person, um, uh, then then this might be compelling. And if it doesn't tell you that, you, you that might be it might not be compelling, but there might be good arguments on either side to consider. But but just to point out this, I think that we're coming to one thing that is going to divide people. And I can see it dividing them in the chat about whether they buy what Eric's saying or buy what you're saying, Danny, it has a lot to do with does my intuition allow for that? Um, and I think that's an interesting notion. And since I said all of that, would either of you like to say anything about it or should I move on? I think if, if, if there's an I to the intuition, then it's either person A that looked like me believed this, but then person A ceased to exist and person B came into existence who now believes uh, something different than person A, then you have two different persons. I think the intuition is simply, am I the same person that has change in beliefs and stature and weight and size and shape and other things? Or have there been a multiplicity, possibly infinite number of persons coming into existence and ceasing to exist every time I change a certain subset of beliefs and characteristics? I, I think the latter is more extravagant. And I think intuitively, we are continuance throughout time. Danny? No, that I'll give him the last word there. Okay, uh, here is the last super chat I'm seeing here, and we'll we'll wrap up here before too long. Uh, Converse contender, thank you for that super chat. Just wanted to say Danny is debunked by a universal abstract law. <laughs> Any comment on that? It happens, but. You know. <laughs> All right, Braxton Hunter, question. Eric, are we any closer to understanding how the soul might generate a mental state than we are to understanding how a central nervous system could? How does the soul do it? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a primitive action um, because you're essentially, well, a few things. If you're asking for a mechanism, then I think you let into an infinite regress because if you're going to say, how does a soul generate this? Well, uh, A generates B by way of C. Well, then you can just ask, how does A generate B by way of C? Well, by way of D, you let into an infinite regress. So I think it's a primitive basic action, but I think we're more, uh, we're more justified in saying an immaterial substance can possess and produce an immaterial state than saying a physical aggregate because the body and brain are not substances or a collection of separable parts held together in a certain structure that these collection of aggregates can produce some some type of mental immaterial state or property um and, and i i would even uh go as far as to say that um when you well i i don't want to bring up another argument but but simply that um, there has to be something that grounds this. And if we look at something like free will, so I, I'll not bring up another argument, but alluding to something we didn't even get to touch on, that if we can show that the mind can have effects on the physical, someone like Jeffrey Schwartz, Mario Borgard, leading neuroscientists in their field, have showed that like through cognitive behavioral therapy, the mind can change the chemistry of the brain. So this shows that you can also have immaterial, an immaterial substance, a soul, changing physical aggregates to something like the brain, even rewiring and changing the chemical composition. 
All right. Any response to any? Oh, no, we can proceed. All right. We'll just take a few more here. Um, Michael McClendon says, is Eric more confident that apples fall from trees or that he is a non-material entity? That I'm a non-material entity because at one point I didn't know that apples fell from trees, but I knew that I existed. All right. And another one from him. Uh, can Eric communicate with a human soul that isn't connected to a human brain? Can I communicate with the human soul? Uh, well, the Bible uh, prohibits uh, necromancy, so even if I could, I don't know if I should. Uh, but, I mean, it, it depends on your view, really. On, on, a, on a Christian perspective, sure, in, in, if I'm in an intermediate state, then sure, it's metaphysically possible, in my view, to communicate with another soul that's disembodied. But I don't know if that answers. I guess that answers the question. But I don't yeah, know. and I don't expect you to have much to say to that, Danny, but if you want to, you can. Um, but I thought I'd just go ahead and throw up here. Here's a question for Danny. What happens when your body dies? Um, probably cease to exist, but I think it's logically possible that, um, uh, there's an afterlife. So, all right. So and would you Eric like to accept Christ in your heart right now? <laughs> Maybe another time. <laughs> it didn't Maybe another time. There's hope. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Eric. Is consciousness merely an emergent property on the brain? So how would one prove that a mind can survive the death of the brain? Yeah, well, so far I haven't argued that uh, that you can survive the death of the body. I do believe you can. I'm just saying I haven't argued that. I've mentioned that just as a way to show that it's not incoherent on my overall position. Uh, but no, I don't think consciousness is an emergent property of the brain. I'm not sure what Danny's view is, but um, for a number of reasons, because I, I think at best when you rearrange uh, these physical uh, states, all you can get at best are structural properties. You're not going to get any type of immaterial sui generis properties. Um, so I don't think the mind is emergent. Uh, I, I think the mind is grounded in, in the soul. It's, it's, a, it's a faculty of the soul, and it's correlated with the physical brain, much like the note C is correlated with a guitar or E flat with certain keys on a piano. Danny? Yeah, I, I, I'm quite... I think the notion of emergence is just quite an elusive term. Um, people use it to mean all sorts of things in philosophy and in everyday language. So it's even, it's confusing in both fields. Uh, so I tend, I try to avoid that term, although sometimes I'm guilty. Um, it, they, they want to say that it's not cause effect, but it's not identity. And then they might appeal to some weird philosophical concepts like supervenience. And I think it gets really bogged down and confusing. And I'm, I distance myself from, from that. Um, Danny, I'm sure Amen. it's true of you also, but I'm glad to see that Eric has fans on the other side of the planet. Um, hello from the Philippines. And last question hey, of Joe. the evening. Last question from the evening. Um, and I guess this is for Danny. And it is, is a person temporarily a different person slash soul? Or I guess it could be for both then. If they suffer an injury that erases blocks of memory or knowledge about themselves, like amnesia, like are they temporarily a different person? Like if they get those memories back, I guess. Yeah, it depends on how you're stipulating personhood there, right? So if you want to stipulate in terms of their identitarian commitments, they're a different person, right? But if you want to stipulate in terms of their belief that, let's say they, for some reason, they, they knew who their mother was, if you're stipulating that as the criteria for identity through time, then they're the same person. Depend. That's why I think... I didn't do a good job of it, but I think that's what I mean by it being conventional when we say that something endures through time. I think that you stipulate your what properties or what the interesting uh, thing that endures, whether that be uh, something like a soul or a set of um, views or, or identitarian commitments. And then you can, well, that trivially, the, the answer follows trivially, right? I think the main problem that I have with soul is that I'm just kind of, I, I think that I mean, this is for future Eric and I are really going to have to get into what a soul is exactly like the immaterial substance, substance theory and all that stuff. We didn't have time to go over that, but that's, that's what I have to say about the question. Any response to that, Eric? Or did, or was um, that a response? Uh, <laughs> I'm lost uh, now. Um, no, uh, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I just think there there are, and even going back to the intuitions, I, I just think Danny's view implies what I would consider absurdities and, and, and for, for those who may not be aware, I'm not saying Danny's absurd. And I know he knows this, but just anyone listening, I'm saying I think the view leads, it's a reductio ad absurdum because, you know, going back to the, let's say, 
the essential subset of properties to to be this to be person A is that they possess beliefs X, Y, and Z. But let's say this person A or this. I forgot what letter I gave. Let's say person A is married to to this woman, gets in a car wreck and loses belief X, Y, and Z. So now the person ceased to exist. There's a new person came into existence and this person is single. But let's suppose a few months later after some therapy, they are able to regain their memories and now once again hold belief X, Y, and Z. Well, then you're going to have to say that the person existed, ceased to exist, and somebody temporarily existed, and then the person came back into existence. And now you have a case in which you have two things coming into it, one thing coming into existence twice, which doesn't even seem to make sense to me. And I just think it's a view that would lead to absurd conclusions like that. And while I'm sure you have something immediately to say, Danny, this is kind of the point we've been kicking around for the past hour, isn't it? Um, well, let, let's close with this. I said that was the last question, but I got another super chat. So hang with me. Plus, we're getting done ahead of schedule. And, yeah, and we're that's gonna, why I don't mind going. More. Yeah, yeah. And I want to give you guys both a five minute, if you want five minutes of a uh, closing statement. But last super chat, I have it here from Converse Contender. And this person says, who should we read on Danny's view? And they didn't add it as a super chat, but they also want to know about Eric's view. So maybe Danny, you can start and, and maybe recommend some literature and then Eric can follow. Oh, in, in terms of my view, uh, because all the stuff that I read from to get to some of my views about mind are very um, are not very friendly towards the layman. Um, but um, I I tell you I'll tell you who influenced me. Um, so there's a philosopher named Donald Davidson. Um, he influenced me. He wrote Anomalous Monism. Um, that's an interesting paper, although hard to read. But uh, that was sort of influential. His student Akhil Bulgrami. Um, wrote a book called Self Knowledge and Resentment. Talks about identity and self knowledge and free will and value, and he intertwines all these issues. Um, and he's not that bad to read. Uh, it just you know, it's intermediate to advanced, probably more advanced. But uh, he wrote a book called Self Knowledge and Resentment. I am accessible via email if you need help um, understanding some of the concepts. Um, but yeah, that's where I am coming from in terms of my philosophy of mind. Eric? Uh, yeah, uh, anyone who knows me, it's no surprise that I'm a huge fan of Moreland. This is probably my favorite book that he wrote on the soul. It's called Body and Soul, Human Nature and the Crisis in Ethics with him and Scott B. Ray. It, it uses a lot of, um, or rather, I use a lot of the arguments that are presented in this book. It goes into a lot of ethical things and, and implications like euthanasia, in vitro fertilization, abortion, things like that. Um, as Danny was saying, not friendly to the layman, uh, Consciousness and the Existence of God. Uh, it's, it's a very technical book, but it's a great book if, if you can understand it and get through it. Um, another technical book, um, The Black Coast Companion to Substance Dualism. Also yeah, great stuff. dollars in your pocket, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I, I got this pirated, so uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> I saved up and cut a lot of grass. Got a lot of grass as a Mets going to get this. Um, uh, Eric LaRock's argument is in there. Hasker's uh, argument that I mentioned as well. Um, uh, uh, this is technically intermediate, though, for the layman, they might not think so. Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. There's like six or seven chapters. That's the new cover. That's the new version. Yeah, and and I've I've read the first one, but even you know just going back, there's a lot of stuff that's been added, and uh, you you can't. I'm not even going to try to show. I'm um, just. Yeah, a lot of stuff has been, not a lot, there's substantial, significant stuff that's been added uh, with metaphysics, philosophy of mind. I, there's a whole chapter on identity through change uh, and, and all, a lot of the relevant stuff that I was mentioning. Do y'all know that scene from Bridesmaids now, it's, this is a good Christian channel, it's rated R, so I know y'all have never seen stuff like that. But like, uh, there's a scene in Bridesmaids where like the maid of honor like made a speech in a short and then someone that arrival comes and makes a longer speech and then she takes back the microphone and now i feel like i feel like i have to one up you know like, danny you, you can be our bridesmaid okay yeah but um no i think that i would recommend for intro i gave unfriendly recommendations to be honest so a friendly recommendation is i think um, i think a lot of what he said was good as uh pfizer's book on philosophy of mind is actually really good for intro level philosophy of mind stuff right and some of my views are actually ca uh, captured in that in that um that book. So uh, Edward Pfizer uh, did a philosophy of mind intro to a uh, beginner's book to uh, pretty good. 
there's another expensive book. The, the I don't know. I think it's called the philosophy of mind, but it's, I think it's the Oxford handbook on philosophy of mind. And, uh, if I'm right, um, it might have been edited by Goff. I don't know. But the point is, it's really good. And if you just keep Google handy while you're going through and look up words you don't know and watch a quick YouTube video while you're going through the book, it's helpful. Um, guys, that's been a really great. And, and I'm going to let you do five minute closings up to five minutes. You don't have to take five minutes. And uh, but I do want to say, obviously, I love Eric. Um, I think he's incredible. But I really want you all to know, you hear me say on this channel a lot, those that watch uh, when I'm responding to an atheist, man, I really like this person that you know, I think I could hang out with them. Well, I, I say that and I mean it. I don't always say it. Sometimes it's not true. But I certainly feel that about Danny. And Danny has not only been uh, friendly to us, but he's um, He's been offered to he's offered to help in in certain ways and like he just did in recommending uh, things for you and so uh, he's he's a friend of this channel and and I mean it when we say this is a channel that loves atheists we do and we're glad that you're here Danny I'm glad you're my friend so let's go ahead and let you start and I'll just put the camera on you Danny and uh, go ahead and and tell us what you thought about tonight so some of these issues that we discussed um, you could dedicate your life to. Um, you could literally study these questions for the rest of your life and you wouldn't, you would still feel like it's incomplete. So doing it in two hours is difficult. Um, but I think we really, I wanted to just really focus on this identity through time stuff. I think that for me, what maintains identity through time is what you stipulate, right? So, um, if you stipulate by person that's endured through T1 to T2, I mean that they have these subset of beliefs, then it trivially follows that they've endured, right? Now, there's a trivial sense in which I do um, agree with Eric, right? If you just stipulate that um, for this person, they have this soul and that soul continues temporally, then that person endures temporally. A physicalist can do the same thing, right? Um, uh, bracketing some of the concerns like the aggregate and all that stuff. But the idea is that this person had this brain, this brain endures that through this um, period of time. So that person endures, right? And I'm saying that uh, it's it's conventional in terms of what it, what you think endures through time, right? If you're talking about this specific set of beliefs or that thing that that consciousness possesses, um, I don't think it's. Uh, I think Eric wants to say that there is this ultimate sense of identity through time, and I'm, I, I find that somewhat elusive. So maybe that's a good conversation to have for the future. All right. I'm muted. Sorry about that. There's Eric. Uh, I'll just jump in here out of order for just a minute because I'm just going to hand it over to Eric. Eric, go ahead and share with us uh, your thoughts about what was discussed tonight. Uh, yeah, like Danny was saying, I mean, we, we pretty much barely scratched the surface. I mean, in two hours to talk about these deep metaphysical issues, and, and there are things we didn't even address. And I don't, I don't hold that against Danny. You know, some people want to say, oh, these these uh, points went, went unaddressed, therefore, you know, he concedes him. I uh, don't think that for, for a second. Uh, I agree with you, Braxton, that, um, yeah, I love Danny. Um, I want to see him in heaven, uh, um, you know, in the afterlife. Uh, and he said, he even said, there's a lot of things we talked about that you can devote your life to. Yes, and amen, uh, like Jesus. Uh, um, so I'm definitely going to be praying for Danny. Um, he's a sharp thinker. I won't say this about many atheists, but I'll say this. Subscribe to Danny's channel because he is a sharp thinker, and he's not going to try and – not saying that all atheists do this. Don't misunderstand me. Don't take don't take this clip and take it out of context. But um, uh, not all atheists do this, but Danny is one who is not going to try and – uh, twist the philosophy to try to meet his position. He's, as you've seen today, he's happy to concede something that's going to be consistent with his view. And I've even, uh, in preparation, uh, uh, my limited preparation today, watched some videos of Danny, and he's explaining the terms. And I would agree with a lot of things he's explaining. So it, a lot of what Danny does on his channel is just it really explain philosophy, which is great because I think the more philosophy you learn, the closer you're going to get to becoming a Christian because I think all truth is grounded and points to God. So yeah, I encourage you to, to check out Danny's channel, subscribe to it. He's, he's an honest guy uh, who's going to present it like it is. And then of course he'll, he'll give his position or take on it, tell you where he doesn't have a position on and he'll be honest throughout the whole thing. So, um, but that's not really a, a closing, I, I guess in, in closing, um, <clears throat> I, I would say, yeah, um, go back and look at and try to glean what you can if you're not familiar with these topics. Uh, it's a lot that was said. Um, 
I don't want to beat a dead horse because I think we've already uh, talked about the issues of identity through change, um, that whether or not there is identity through change. And um, I, I would I would just say that when when you're looking at these things, look at the implications, look look at what's consistent, look at at what makes the most logical sense. And um, I mean, yeah, not much more to say to that other than thank you, Danny, uh, uh, for having this discussion with me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really a lot of fun. And I appreciate both of you guys. I hope this will be a blessing or a help to you, whoever you are out there. And we'll definitely have both of you guys back. Danny, I need to have you on sometime for something else. Um, this has been great. Subscribe to both these guys' channels if you're interested in the sort of topics that we're discussing here. And um, I guess that's the end. I'll tell you, I sure have enjoyed this. I, I, we're going to put it on the audio-only podcast uh, so you can get it there too if you want. But um, listen, if you're not subscribed to this channel, I really would encourage you to do that and um, hit that notification bell uh, so you know when we have other videos coming out. I want to do more debates. But this has been a blast. Thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate you. And uh, with that, I guess we'll just say we'll see you next time. Uh, don't you guys go anywhere, but the rest of you, we'll see you next time on Trinity Radio.